Chapter 7 Seeds Ajahn Mondi and I spent two consecutive rains retreats at Non Ni Wait Monastery in Udon Thani. Following the second retreat, a delegation of lay devotees from neighboring Sakon Nakhon province came to visit Ajahn Mondi. After exchanging heartfelt greetings, they expressed a fervent wish that Ajahn Mon consider moving to Sakonakon to take up residence in the province for the spiritual benefit of the Buddhist faithful there. When he agreed, the delighted visitors quickly set about making travel arrangements. As usual, I accompanied him on the journey. By that time, I'd been Ajahn Mon's personal attendant for two full years. Upon our arrival at Sakon Nakhon late 1941, Ajahn Mondi and I were escorted to Sudawat Monastery in the provincial capital. Soon, crowds of monks and laity were packing the Dhamma Hall, eager to pay their respects and seek his advice. Several days after we arrived at Sudawat Monastery, Ajahn Mond received a correspondence from his friend and mentor, Ajahn Sao Kanta Silo who wrote asking Ajahn Mon to visit him in Ubon Rachatani province because he had fallen gravely ill. Reluctant to make the long trek to Ubon himself, Ajahn Mon entrusted me to go on his behalf to attend to Ajahn Sao's needs and nurse him back to good health. I was to inform Ajahn Sao that, with all due respect, Ajahn Mon had sent me to be his attendant. When Ajahn Mond instructed me to take special care of Ajahn Sao, he stressed that even if his symptoms abated, I was not to trust that he was cured. He reminded me that Ajahn Sao would be 82 years old soon, and his health had been on the decline for some time. I immediately took off on foot for Ubon. With my umbrella tent slung over one shoulder and my bowl hanging from the other, I trekked south along forest tracks that passed through mountain ranges thick with dense foliage, where small settlements were often a day's walk apart. After two weeks of hiking, I finally arrived at Ubon and found Ajahn Sao recuperating at Don Tat Monastery in the Pibun Mangsa Han district. The cause of Ajahn Sao's symptoms was a severe allergic reaction. While Ajahn Sao sat meditating under a large rubber tree one afternoon, a hawk happened to swoop down through the overhead branches to snatch its prey. By some twist of fate, the hawk's wing collided with a beehive suspended from a branch high up in the tree. Suddenly dislodged, the hive crashed to the ground and split open a few feet from where Ajahn Sao sat. The agitated bees swarmed his body and stung him repeatedly. While under attack from all directions, Ajahn Sao managed to crawl under a nearby mosquito net, after which the bees gradually dispersed. It was a reaction to the bee stings that had caused Ajahn Sao's acute condition. When I arrived, Ajahn Sao's skin appeared flushed, his throat and tongue were swollen, and he had difficulty breathing. Additionally, he suffered bouts of dizziness and felt unsteady on his feet. I immediately went to work trying to relieve the most severe symptoms, but despite my efforts, his condition only seemed to worsen. Using my fingernails, I scraped out a few stingers that remained embedded in his skin. To relieve the persistent redness, pain, and swelling, I crushed handfuls of soothing forest herbs and applied them to his body as a poultice to reduce the inflammation. After several days, the swelling and the skin discoloration subsided, and I eventually managed to nurse Ajahn Sao back to health. Don Tat Monastery was a 50-acre plot of land situated in the middle of the Moon River. The island monastery was the first monastery built by Ajahn Sao. Local farmers had previously planted rice on the island's low-lying land near the water's edge, but had left the hilly, forested interior alone. Impressed by the island's seclusion, Ajahn Sao crossed over and began meditating on the island's forested hills. Before long, the villagers who supported him with alms food had developed such strong faith in him that they offered him their low-lying fields as a site to build a monastery, thus turning the whole island into a residence for monks. Originally, the local villagers had called the island Dawn Tak, or Leech Island, because the damp forest floor was teeming with leeches. 
the villagers were bitten by hordes of leeches whenever they entered the forest to look for wild vegetables and medicinal plants. After Ajahn Sao took up residence on the island, however, the locals changed its name slightly to Dawn Tat, Tat meaning holy relic. Ajahn Sao told me that before arriving at Dawn Tat, he had wandered continuously from place to place, spending nights camping in rural rice fields and pastures, sometimes taking shelter inside rice barns or under large shady trees. Before the sun set below the horizon each day, he would have already found a place to hang his umbrella tent and spend the night. When he first reached the area around Dawn Tot, he camped under a large core tree near Dawn Panchat village. The monks accompanying him set up their umbrella tents in a woodland area nearby. Ajahn Sao told me a strange story about the large flock of crows that lived in the branches of that core tree. The whole flock exhibited abnormal behavior. They flew over and around the big tree where he camped all day, making raucous cawing sounds from dawn to dusk. The local villagers didn't dare take any action against them because they believed that the crows belonged to the guardian spirit that lived in the tree. They were terrified that if they harmed the crows, the powerful spirit might curse them and cause them misfortune. For his part, Ajahn Sao saw the crows as companions in birth aging sickness and death. Out of compassion, he began feeding them the leftover food from his alms bowl every morning. Soon the crows became especially attached to him. Each morning as Ajahn Sao left his campsite under the tree and began his walk to the village for alms, he called out to them, Dear lovesick crows, let's go on alms round together. Let's go help others who are suffering. Life on earth is difficult for humans and animals alike. Upon hearing this call to action, the flock of crows flew out from the core tree and soared above Ajahn Sao while he walked to the village. The airborne procession of crows was a remarkable sight. Flying and cawing loudly in advance of Ajahn Sao, they heralded his approach to the village every morning. At first, people were astounded. They couldn't believe their eyes. They had vested the guardian spirit of the core tree with so much power, only to realize that their belief in it had been misguided. At the same time, their faith in Ajahn Sao increased until it became unshakable. Before Ajahn Sao showed up, the villagers had taken refuge in the guardian spirit in the core tree for generations. From then on, however, they instead took the power of the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha as their refuge. The villagers' faith was so sincere that they brought their small children outside and lined them up with everyone else to bow down before Ajahn Sao as he walked past their homes on his morning alms round. Ajahn Sao was always kind. Loving kindness radiated from him wherever he went. He never scolded the villagers or criticized them for their beliefs. Instead, he possessed many clever techniques for teaching Dhamma lessons to the local inhabitants. Through the power of his inexhaustible loving-kindness, Ajahn Sao remained a steadfast refuge for living beings, animals, humans, and devas alike. As soon as Ajahn Sao had fully recovered from the effects of the bee stings and regained his strength, he crossed the Mekong River and traveled on foot to the Laotian village of Li Pi to preside over a ceremony dedicating merit to his deceased preceptor. Ajahn Sao had wandered Dutanga in the southern provinces of Laos every year for decades. He usually lived and practiced in the Laotian province of Jumpasak, near the village of Li Pi, on the banks of the Mekong River during the cold and hot seasons, then returned to Don Tat Monastery for the rainy season retreat each year. Ajahn Sao decided to travel to Laos by himself on that occasion. I was to join him there a little while later. Initially, I felt reluctant to accompany him to Jump Pasak because I already had my mind set on returning to Sakon Nakon to rejoin Ajahn Man. But I couldn't stop thinking about the instructions Ajahn Man gave me before I left. Jia, take special care of Ajahn Sao for me, all right? Even if his symptoms improve and he feels better, be cautious. Don't trust the improvement in his health. 
When Ajahn Sao was well on his way to Jampasak in Laos, I gathered together three monks, a novice, and a white-robed postulant from Don Tat Monastery, and together we set off in pursuit of Ajahn Sao. We hiked first along the Mekong River toward the Suan Kiri Mountains, which are situated at the mouth of the Moon River where it flows into the Mekong. We spent the first night camped in the Suan Kiri Mountains. The next day a lay supporter invited our group to stay at one of his properties near the river. His land contained a huge forest where wild animals like elephants, tigers, and bears roamed freely. Its waters teemed with what the locals called freshwater dolphins, which made low-pitched crying sounds, similar to a cow's mooing. The villagers constructed tiger traps from the branches and trunks of the large rubber trees that grew tall throughout the forest. The traps were designed so that a tiger passing through them would dislodge a low-lying branch, causing a heavy tree trunk to crash down on its back and kill it. Not knowing what a tiger trap looked like, I pushed a branch to the side as our group passed through the dense foliage, causing a log to fall and stab me in the leg. The pain was excruciating. I rubbed the wound with medicinal oil for hours before I could walk again. After camping only briefly in that forest, we resumed our journey to meet Ajahn Sao at Jumpasuk. As our group trekked along the west bank of the Mekong River, a local tradesman who was also headed to Jumpasuk invited us to join him for a ride on his paddleboat. The rains had been heavier than usual that year, and the Mekong had swollen and overflowed its banks. The river's flow was so strong and its surface so choppy that it threatened to capsize our boat. Because the boat was propelled by the swiftness of that rough current, it was difficult to control. As it bounced up and down on the rough waves, the boat suddenly plunged into the gaping mouth of a large whirlpool, startling the boatman, who completely lost control of the oars. The boat was immediately drawn into the rotating mass of water where it spun wildly around the opening at least twenty times, while we desperately held onto the gunnels for our very lives. Had it been a larger boat, like a barge, it probably would have gone around once and then moved on. But ours was a small paddle boat, which was nearly impossible to control in a strong, swirling current. Nevertheless, from my childhood experience with boats, I instinctively knew what to do. I yelled at the boatman to paddle hard against the flow of the whirling water and aim for the outer edge of the opening. I added my powerful stroke to help. With everyone's assistance, we prevented the boat from filling with water and just managed to escape without harm. We might have died if the boat had been drawn into the whirlpool's center. We rode the Mekong's raging current without further incident until we reached our destination. After we disembarked, I led the monks to Umat Monastery in Jumpasak, hoping to catch up with Ajahn Sao there. But we arrived too late. He was already out on the forest trails, hiking to Li Pi Falls in the very south of Laos. Our group remained at Umat Monastery for a short while, then hiked into the forest again. We found a secluded location to meditate near Sahua Creek, about six miles from the center of Jump Pasuk Town, and remained there for the following six weeks. The small village settlement near Sahua Creek had only 18 houses. During our sojourn there, we ate nothing but local village food. Because I stayed there for the purpose of Dhamma, the villagers' rough diet wasn't a problem for me. They offered us mostly sticky rice and small boiled rice field crabs, which I had difficulty eating because they were so dry and acidic. We were meditating peacefully at our Sahua Creek campsite one morning when a messenger arrived to deliver a letter from Ajahn Mao of Umat Monastery, stating that Ajahn Sao was seriously ill. We were informed that Ajahn Sao was traveling back from southern Laos on a boat that was expected to dock at Jumpasak around 5 p.m. that day. Ajahn Mao requested that Ajahn Sao's nephew Tan Peng and I be present at the riverside landing to receive Ajahn Sao and help attend to his needs. We set off without delay and arrived at the pier just in time. 
When Ajahn Sao's boat arrived at the dock, Tan Peng and I saw immediately that he was in critical condition. We arranged for a stretcher to carry him to Umat Monastery, where we laid him down to rest inside the wood-framed ordination hall. As Ajahn Sao lay there breathing softly, he signaled to us with his hands, indicating that he wanted us to help him up so he could bow down to the Buddha statue. We gently maneuvered his weak, frail body into a bowing posture, with knees on the floor and back erect. He bowed to the Buddha and rose slowly but gracefully two times. After completing his third bow, I noticed that he remained prostrate with his forehead touching the floor for an unusually long time. Approaching him cautiously, I gently checked his wrist and could not detect even the faintest pulse. Seeing this, the other monks present in the hall began saying, Ajahn Sao is dead. Ajahn Sao just died. I quickly reprimanded them. Ajahn Sao has not yet died. He is in a deep state of samadhi. Stay quiet and don't interfere. Since Ajahn Sao continued to stay prostrate on the floor facing the Buddha statue, I decided to slowly move his body to a reclining posture. Because he was on the brink of death, moving his limp, lifeless body required skill and concentration. As I respectfully tried to reposition Ajahn Sao's body, I noticed the monks and novices seated behind us sobbing and weeping. I told them sharply to leave the hall and wait quietly outside. Once I'd managed to maneuver Ajahn Sao's body into a supine position, he took three prolonged breaths and passed away peacefully. The time was 5.30 p.m. on the third day of February, 1942. Ajahn Sao was 82 years old. Immediately after Ajahn Sao's passing, I began putting all my energy into the preparations for his cremation. First, I did everything I could think of that required immediate attention. I telegraphed Mr. Wichit, a student of Ajahn Sao in Ubon Rachatani, to give him the sad news. I then found the large wooden mortar that I would use to break up charcoal. That done, I searched for a sizable log to use as a pestle. With the pestle in hand, I broke large chunks of charcoal into small pieces and placed the charcoal lumps at the bottom of Ajahn Sao's coffin where they would soak up the corpse's decomposition fluids, thus preventing foul odors. This method was the standard practice before modern embalming techniques took its place. When pounding the large chunks, it's important to use high-quality charcoal to make sure that the smaller pieces don't crumble into dust while being broken up. I spread two large sacks of crushed charcoal inside the coffin to a depth of about ten inches. By the time I'd finished, I was completely covered in black soot, so I jumped in the river to wash up. After lining the coffin with charcoal, I draped a clean, white cloth over Ajahn Sao's body. Once the charcoal was suitably spread and the white cloth properly arranged, I gingerly placed Ajahn Sao's body inside the coffin. As a final act of service, with a heart full of devotion, I got down on my knees and bowed to his coffin three times. I then silently asked his forgiveness for any offense I might have committed against him in thought, word, or deed, by way of greed, aversion, or delusion, either intentionally or unintentionally. To give his devotees in Jump Pasuk the opportunity to pay their final respects, I left Ajahn Sao's body on display in the ordination hall at Ummat Monastery for several days. At the earliest suitable occasion, I arranged to have his coffin placed on a boat and ferried across the Mekong to the Thai side of the river. When the boat reached Thailand, a large gathering of senior monks and lay devotees from Ubon Rachatani were waiting at the dock with a motorized vehicle to carry Ajahn Sao's body back to the monastery in Ubon, where it would be cremated. Shortly after I placed Ajahn Sao's body on the ferry boat, I left Jampasak on foot. I trekked along the Laotian side of the Mai Kong before crossing over into Thailand at Amnat Jalern province. In Amnat Jalern, 
I stayed for a while with a John Sao's most senior disciple, a John Tong, then started my return trip to Sakon Nakhon province, hoping to rejoin a John Mon in time for the beginning of the next rains retreat. During the time I was away from him, Ajahn Mond had led his monks and novices from Suda Wat Monastery into the forests on the eastern slopes of the Pupan mountain range. They first set up camp near Na Si Nguyen village. Later, the whole group hiked further into the wilderness, staying for a while near Na Mon village, before they finally settled in a small forest monastery near the village of Ban Kok. The location suited a John Mond's temperament perfectly, as it was very quiet and secluded both day and night. He lived there free of illness, experiencing no recurrence of malaria and its painful symptoms. As soon as I learned of Ajahn Mond's whereabouts, I set off immediately for Ban Kok village in Sakon Nakhon province, which was located about 180 miles north of Uban following regional foot trails. I hiked at a steady pace along earthen paths that passed through rough, hilly terrain, stopping in the evening to camp in remote cremation grounds, wide open fields, haystacks, forest dens, or under overhanging cliffs and outcrops. Wherever I ended up at nightfall, that's where I spent the night. My two years of living in the wilderness with Ajahn Mon had prepared me to cope with the hardships of trekking through this vast expanse of jungle. Even the crudeness of the village food offerings no longer bothered me. I felt I was ready to die on the trail, if need be. As I trekked over mountains and across valleys following in the footsteps of the old Dutanga masters, my heart took courage from reflecting on Ajahn Sao and the inspiration his life provided to an aspirant on the Buddha's noble path. The meditative lifestyle of trekking through wilderness areas and observing the ascetic Dutanga practices had been revived in the modern era largely by the efforts of Ajahn Sao Kanta Silo. He set the example that Ajahn Mon would follow and pass on to his disciples. Ajahn Sao's Dutanga wanderings had taken him through all the wilderness areas on both sides of the Mekong River, Lao and Tai. When he was younger, Ajahn Sao hiked continuously as a way of life. With no particular destination in mind, he simply accepted whatever life's changing circumstances provided. Even when his journey did have a destination, he never knew what would be waiting for him when he arrived. At the close of each day, he settled for any shelter that was available, the base of a tree, an overhanging cliff, or a farmer's dilapidated rice barn. When no proper shelter presented itself, he simply lay down out in the open air. Early every morning, he slung his alms bowl over one shoulder and walked through the vacant landscape to the nearest village settlement in search of food for the day. The rations he received were usually meager, though enough to sustain his wandering lifestyle. Occasionally, however, he received nothing at all and had to continue his journey on an empty stomach. As a rule, he practiced meditation in conditions of perpetual hunger and hardship. With only his three principal robes to clothe him, he struggled to keep warm in the cold season and dry in the rainy season. Taxing his body severely, Ajahn Sao stoically carried on with his meditation because he wanted to reach the end of the Buddha's path to freedom from suffering. Over time, his years of painful practice transformed his very being into a noble presence of perfect happiness. Hiking and practicing the Dutanga way alone for once, I resolved to take Ajahn Sao's conduct as my standard. Since I experienced no external disturbances to distract me from my purpose, I saw this journey as an ideal opportunity to put all my strength and energy into meditation. The Buddha often described the virtues of monks wandering into the depths of forests and mountains, seeking secluded locations to support them in the development of meditation for the realization of the truth of his teachings. After all, the Buddha himself was born in a forest and attained enlightenment in a forest. He taught the Dhamma in forest environments and passed away under two magnificent sal trees. The Buddha frequently dwelt in the wilderness areas of northern India, both during his spiritual quest and after his supreme enlightenment. 
Before he passed away, he left explicit instructions that preceptors who ordain new monks must advise them on the advantages of residing in the forest and meditating at the base of a tree. In accordance with those instructions, forest dhamma practices continue to be faithfully observed to this day. The Buddha once proclaimed, Bhikkhus, cut back the jungle but don't cut down the trees. The dangers you face come from the jungle. Once you've cut back the jungle, you will have tamed the wilderness. Some of the monks in attendance were perplexed by the Buddha's statement. Cut back the jungle, but don't cut down the trees? What does the Buddha mean by that? In fact, the Buddha was using the jungle as an analogy for the mind, with its prolific undergrowth of defilements that spreads out in all directions. He was telling the monks to cut back the riotous undergrowth of greed, aversion, and delusion by uprooting the dense and tangled offshoots of mental defilements. The cravings that cause suffering and the attachments they spawn create a seemingly impenetrable jungle-like disorder and confusion in the mind. Clearing away this jungle once and for all opens an avenue to the supreme happiness of Nibbana. The word Nibbana indicates the absence of all defilements. In other words, laying waste to the mind's jungle. This, at least, is the scholarly interpretation of what the Buddha had to say. However, if Ajahn Mon were asked to translate this teaching, his interpretation would be much more blunt and direct. Those jungles teeming with delusion, craving, and clinging must be totally eradicated by supreme wisdom. It is not enough to merely chop the trees down at the trunk. You must pull the whole tree out by the roots. Don't cut down the trees. Uproot them instead. Ajahn Mon translated quotes from the ancient Pali texts based on his own personal experience. He spoke directly to their essential meaning, often bypassing the strict rules of Pali grammar preferred by scholars. The uniqueness of his translations gave us a glimpse of the true purpose of the Buddha's teachings. From the point of view of forest dhamma, Ajahn Mon's interpretation of those teachings was always insightful and inspiring. As March approached, the weather turned hot and dry. While hiking, I was on the lookout for places with tall, shady trees that allowed cooling breezes to move freely under their foliage. Walking beneath them helped bring relief from the stifling heat. Having been away from Ajahn Mond and his guidance for many months, I began to feel a bit lonely and adrift. Still, because I had fulfilled the responsibilities he entrusted to me when I departed, I felt confident that the power of his all-embracing virtue would protect me as I made my way back. Whether hiking, thinking, or conversing with the locals, I constantly heard Ajahn Mon's distinct voice in the back of my mind, coaxing me to remain focused and resolute in my practice. The subtle sound of Ajahn Mon's encouragement created a sense of buoyancy and contentment in my heart. I felt as though I was walking through a shady grove, where cool water to quench my thirst was never far away. During long, hot days on the trail, when my mind started longing for some measure of ease and comfort, I imagined a John Mond's powerful voice admonishing me not to clutter my mind with frivolous desires. With each sign of weakness, I could hear his warnings in my head. Don't burden your mind with excessive thinking. It has enough to consider without adding dead weight to the load. Keep your wants simple. Don't wish for more than the minimum allowance of a monk's basic requisites. Be contented with little so that your life does not become a messy collection of material possessions. Carrying around stuff in excess of what's necessary just for the sake of comfort and convenience can be fatal for a Dutanga monk intent on following in the Buddha's footsteps. Greed can easily lay a trap that ensnares the unwitting monk and often leads to his ignoble downfall. So you must always remain one step ahead of greedy intentions in order to avoid the traps that will prevent you from achieving the highest goal. I had heard Ajahn Mond speak this admonition to his disciples many times. 
He often warned that a monk who hungers for possessions is as vulnerable to ruin as a hungry animal that cannot resist the bait in a deadly trap. He compared this cruel deception to a trap used by hunters in northeastern Thailand. To construct the device, trappers erected a pile of heavy stones, placed loosely on one another, and propped up in a precarious fashion with a few sticks. Bait was then placed underneath the stones. Upon spying the food, hungry animals like squirrels, chipmunks, monkeys, or gibbons abandoned their natural caution and unwittingly dashed into the trap. They were bound to strike one of the support sticks on the way in and bring the whole load of stones crashing down on top of them, ensuring an agonizing death. The message for Dutanga monks was, Don't let your guard down or act heedlessly. Some forest monks ignored this warning. They trekked through the wilderness with the sincere intention of practicing meditation for the sake of Nibbana. Eventually, one of them became well known for his diligence in the practice and his exploits in wild places. People sought him out to prostrate themselves at his feet and honor him as a spiritual hero. They praised him glowingly and lavished him with costly gifts. Ambushed by the siren call of greed, this monk soon forgot his original purpose. He forgot the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha and the teachings of the great Ajans. Delighted by material possessions, he became the victim of his own defilements, which crashed down on his head like a load of heavy stones. Lacking moral shame, his behavior led to stressful situations and nagging feelings of regret, which made meditation difficult, if not impossible, to develop properly. With Ajahn Mond's cautionary tale echoing in my heart, I was motivated to keep my distance from social interactions. This trek was my first experience walking Dutanga alone, and I was determined to maintain my inward focus until I reached the oasis of Ajahn Mond's monastery. After hiking and camping in the wilderness areas between Amnat Jalern, Nahon Panom, and Muktahan, I decided to take a quicker, more direct route to Sakonakon to hasten my return to Ajahn Mond. The shortcut led me through a region of dense jungle where the tree trunks grew so large that several people could not have encircled them with their arms. Tigers and other wild beasts prowled the undergrowth, occasionally roaring close by the trail. I climbed up and down mountains thick with impenetrable foliage located in sparsely populated areas. Most of the villages were small farming settlements where enterprising country folk eked out a living by clear-cutting small patches of jungle so they could plow the earth and plant subsistence crops. I trekked on through this harsh landscape to the point of exhaustion. By noon of my first day on the trail, I'd gone through all my drinking water. Since I didn't know where to find more water and didn't dare leave the path to look for it, I just pushed on. Eventually, I encountered a jungle dweller who, knowing instinctively what I needed, quickly fetched water and humbly offered me some to quench my thirst. I soon realized that the villagers in those parts felt a common bond with Dutanga monks. Using a common-sense sort of wisdom, I often reflected on the living conditions and the mindset of these hardy village folk. It was obvious to me that their lives were just as rough and austere as mine. But whereas they suffered countless hardships for the sake of building a home and feeding their families, I endured hardships on the trail for the sake of the Dhamma that would free my mind from suffering. They were destitute and overworked, struggling against the natural elements just to survive. Whereas I willingly put my life on the line without fear of hardship, content to struggle against mental defilements until I vanquished them forever. At nightfall, after a long, strenuous day of hiking, I would sit in meditation beneath a roof of leaves or a canopy of stars. Later, if I found a path adequate for walking, I would continue my meditation by pacing back and forth until late into the night. I was motivated to push myself by the fear that Ajahn Mond might question me about my progress in meditation and criticize me if it didn't meet his expectations. 
I finally emerged from that dense jungle when the trail crossed into the province of Sakonnakon. From there, I headed straight to Ban Kok village in Koksi Supan district, where Ajahn Mond had established a small, monastic community in the outlying forest. I passed quickly through the cluster of houses in the village and strode eagerly into the forest monastery, prepared now to respectfully inform Ajahn Mond about everything pertaining to Ajahn Sao's passing away. The monks and novices living with Ajahn Mond at Ban Kok Monastery were an impressive sight. I noticed straight away that they spoke very little. Instead of chatting among themselves, they preferred to practice meditation in solitude, each monk sitting in his own hut or walking in meditation at a separate location out in the forest. They came together after dawn each day for alms round and the morning meal. Each monk walked the distance to and from the village with cautious restraint, mindfully intent on his meditation theme. He never strolled along casually, gazing here and there and chatting with anyone who chanced to pass by. The daily routine inside the monastery was just as disciplined. At 4 p.m., the monks emerged from their huts in unison to sweep the monastery's grounds. When the whole area had been swept, they drew water from the well and carried buckets of it around the monastery to fill up the water barrels used for cleaning their feet and washing their alms bowls. After completing these chores, all the monks bathed at the well in a quiet and composed manner. They performed each daily chore with admirable self-control, attentively focusing mindfulness and discernment on the execution of their assigned tasks. As soon as the day's duties were finished, each monk returned to his hut to sit or walk in mindful meditation. Wherever Ajahn Mond happened to set up camp on his travels, his devoted disciples soon began to congregate. They were drawn by the magnetic pull of his exceptional spiritual power. During his stay at Ban Kok Monastery, the number of monks coming to live with him steadily increased. Besides the monks who lived in the monastery, many others stayed in forest locations within walking distance of the monastery grounds. During the day, they dispersed into the thick forest to do their practice. Before the 1942 rains retreat began, the village community pooled its resources and labored in teams to build small huts for the monks camped in the outlying forests so that they too could join Ajahn Mond for the retreat period. Ajahn Mond ordered me to oversee that construction work, which I continued to do until the buildings were completed, just days before the retreat period started. During that retreat, Ajahn Mond employed a wide variety of methods to persuade the monks under his guidance to maximize their efforts in the practice. He called an evening meeting and gave a Dhamma talk to all the monks at least once a week during the three months of that retreat. The monks sat on the floor facing Ajahn Mond in orderly rows as he elaborated on key points of the Buddha's teachings. His long and detailed talks would usually last about two hours, but would sometimes stretch to three or four. I found his lengthy discourses inspiring and invigorating. I became so absorbed in meditation as I listened that thoughts of weariness and fatigue never crossed my mind. For his part, Ajahn Mond was totally focused on expounding the nature of discipline, concentration, and insight in a profound way that always struck a chord with his audience. He delivered Dhamma talks in a manner that was reminiscent of times past, when the Lord Buddha delivered discourses to large gatherings of monks. We can be sure that the Lord Buddha's discourses were concerned solely with the great treasures of Dhamma, that he spoke only on subjects related to the direct path to Nibbana. As a result, many monks in the Buddha's audience were able to attain the paths, the fruits, and Nibbana right up until the day he passed away. Because his teachings emanated directly from an absolutely pure heart, the Dhamma that the Buddha expounded was so incomparably superb that hearing it inspired many of his listeners to emulate his liberating achievements. The Dhamma talks that Ajahn Mond presented occurred to him spontaneously at the moment he spoke. What he said was never rehearsed. There was no formal introduction or specific conclusion. His talks were not mapped in advance, like journeys with beginnings, rest stops, and final destinations. 
They were instead organic discourses that served to discuss and teach important Dhamma principles in an uplifting fashion. Ajahn Mond did not theorize or speculate when he spoke. His listeners already had their own doubts about meditation. Speculation on his part would only have increased their uncertainty. Instead, his explanations tended to dispel the monks' doubts while they listened. Monks who heard his detailed descriptions of the obstacles they could expect to encounter in meditation were able to apply those lessons to their own practice and by doing so significantly reduce troublesome mental hindrances. Ajahn Mond addressed many different topics during those weekly meetings. He would tell us stories about his past life encounters and recount stories about the initial stages of his own meditation practice, including insights into various experiences that arose in his meditation. He would explain the training methods he used in his struggle to extricate himself from the quagmire of samsaric existence and how those methods led the way to his transcendence of the world of conventional reality. Talk of Ajahn Mond's supreme attainment made those monks who yearned for this transcendent Dhamma eager to experience it for themselves, which prompted some of them to question whether they had enough inherent potential to successfully reach the level of liberation that Ajahn Mond had attained. Perhaps they would remain stuck in the quagmire forever, unable to climb free from Sung Sara's deep pit. How is it that he can attain freedom, yet we still can't rouse ourselves from sleep? When will we be able to achieve the supreme state of freedom that he has? This sort of thinking had the advantage of awakening in the monks a persistent determination to tolerate the hardships they faced while they pressed ahead with their meditation. This firmness of purpose, in turn, permeated every aspect of their practice. Ajahn Mond's disciples were so inspired and energized by the Dhamma, he so kindly elucidated for them that all fear and hesitation vanished. Their faith in him provided them with the strength needed to willingly shoulder the heaviest burdens. The Lord Buddha taught us to associate with the wise. The truth of this teaching is obvious to monks who live in the presence of a good teacher and listen to his uplifting instructions daily. Their enthusiasm gains strength as they gradually assimilate his teachings into their own practical experience, while also making an effort to match his virtuous qualities. Although they cannot hope to equal him in every respect, they can at least attempt to embody some of their teacher's virtues. The opposite also holds true as well. The more we associate with fools, the worse off we become. We can become good through association with good people, or we can suffer harm through association with bad people. If we observe those who have spent a long time training under a skilled teacher, it is evident that they have gained some steadfast principles from that relationship. Conversely, it's obvious that those who get mixed up with fools eventually display the same foolish characteristics. Ajahn Kao An Ahlio was one example of a monk whom Ajahn Mon praised for the sterling example he set for his disciples, both in terms of his resolute practice and his steadfast principles. Though I'd yet to meet Ajahn Kao, Ajahn Mon's descriptions of his life and practice truly amazed me. The fact that Ajahn Kao had the kind of bold character that guaranteed he would put his whole strength into whatever he did strongly resonated with me. He preferred to practice in remote, secluded locations with a single-minded resolve that put him in a class of his own among Ajahn Mond's disciples. He had no difficulty sitting in meditation from dusk until dawn without moving. He could sit the whole night through whenever he chose to do so. In one of his evening Dhamma talks during that retreat, Ajahn Mond made it clear that Ajahn Kao had already followed the Buddha's noble path to the end and attained total freedom from craving and delusion. He stressed that both Ajahn Kao's mode of practice and his level of spiritual attainment were worthy of the utmost respect. He deemed Ajahn Kao fully capable of being an inspiration to his disciples enabling them to reach the higher stages of concentration and wisdom by following faithfully in his footsteps. 
After Ajahn Mon had spoken in praise of Ajahn Kao, he went on to declare that one of the monks seated there in the assembly that night had previously sought him out in the wilds of Chiang Mai to reveal certain results he'd experienced in his meditation practice. From that monk's description, Ajahn Mon could confirm that he had successfully eradicated sensual desire and ill will from his mind, and thus attained the stage on the path to enlightenment known as non-returner. Ajahn Mon also disclosed that the very same attainment that he himself had struggled for twenty-two years to accomplish, the monk in question had achieved in just three. The disparity in the length of time required to reach that attainment, he stated, came down to the difference between the levels of their spiritual perfections and the varying strengths of the karmic legacies they had accrued in the past. The monk in question, you see, was me. But I simply sat there listening respectfully with my head bowed, and Ajahn Mon never mentioned my name. In bringing up his praise of me here, I'm not trying to elevate myself to his level. I simply want to make the point that the spiritual qualities developed in past lives combined with the effort made in meditation during the present life have an effect on how prepared a person is to attain results in Dhamma practice, with some attaining quickly, others more slowly. To a significant degree, the ability to make progress toward enlightenment depends on the cultivation and general excellence of specific spiritual qualities known as the ten paramis, or perfections. These perfections are generosity, moral virtue, renunciation, wisdom, energy, resolve, patience, truthfulness, loving-kindness, and equanimity. They are referred to as perfections because the Bodhisatta perfected these ideal virtues to a transcendent standard of excellence over the course of many eons as he strove to become a Buddha. Similar to a bodhisatta, aspirants on the path must strive to cultivate and refine these ten virtuous perfections in their pursuit of enlightenment. The skillful means needed to make progress along that path hinge on the general excellence of those ten virtuous qualities. How skilled we are at developing them to a high standard will largely determine the strength and depth of our meditation as well as our readiness to understand the higher truths reached at the advanced levels of Dhamma practice. We can only understand what we are ready to understand, and our readiness is largely a matter of the quality of our character, which is determined by the excellence of our perfections. Similarly, only by enriching the quality of our inner being can we become worthy of encountering the right circumstances, the right guidance, and the right insights that will lead us to the realization of Dhamma's highest truths. Our capacity to clearly comprehend all aspects of the Buddha's teachings relies on an accumulation of inner wealth, the value of which is based on the level of the perfections we have developed. As such, cultivating inner worth is a critically important part of the overall practice. Inner worth is not measured by good actions alone, but also by the state of mind and the quality of the intentions with which those actions are performed. A desire to accumulate inner wealth without the intention to abandon harmful acts of body, speech, and mind shows a lack of understanding of the true nature of merit. Merit encompasses all the good and noble intentions in the mind. That's where inner worth resides. When the mind is meritorious, all thoughts, speech, and bodily acts are a source of merit as well. Wisdom is needed to guide intentions in a meritorious direction. Without wise guidance, people become more concerned with the future rewards of their good actions, praise, or good reputation among their peers than with accumulating a long-lasting store of inner wealth. In order to understand the mind's intentions well enough to steer them in the right direction, mental activity must be examined in light of the Buddha's teachings on right intention and right understanding. In order to do so, meditation must be practiced in earnest. Ultimately, merit is a state of mind that we must cultivate within ourselves. When we meditate and investigate within the mind until we reach the heart of wisdom, we will see that evil refers to our own bad and ignoble intentions, and merit refers to our good and noble intentions. 
practicing meditation with the right commitment and determination is the highest form of merit we can make. No other merit exceeds the merit of engaging in the mental training that leads directly toward Nibbana and its final release from suffering. Seeing in my personal background a tough, unruly, and irreverent kid who cursed regularly and never backed down from a fight, some people might reckon that I don't deserve to be in the same league as the Ajans, who are renowned for their outstanding virtue. Even as a monk, I rarely pulled punches, though those on the receiving end were usually unruly defilements and mental hindrances blocking my path. But that rough outward appearance is just my personality, not my true nature. External appearances and personality traits are natural expressions of the five aggregates, which display the unique physical and mental characteristics of each person. Those personality traits should not be mistaken for spiritual virtues and their levels of perfection, which exist outside the domain of the five aggregates. This distinction between observable personality traits and inner spiritual worth is clearly illustrated in the life of the notorious bandit Angulimala. Angulimala was a young Brahmin and scholar at the time of the Buddha, who prior to meeting the Buddha and attaining arahantship, embarked on a murderous rampage, terrorizing the local population to accomplish a macabre mission. When he spotted the Buddha walking one day, he grabbed his weapons and dashed out to murder him. Angulimala expected to easily overtake him, but even though the Buddha was only walking, serene and unhurried, Angulimala found that he couldn't catch up to him. Exhausted and frustrated, he yelled at the Buddha to stop. The Buddha told him that he had already stopped. He had stopped killing and harming, and now it was time for him to do likewise. Angulimala was so struck by these words that he immediately cast away his weapons and followed the Buddha back to the monastery where he was ordained as a monk and later became an arahant. How on earth could a villainous murderer known to have killed nearly 1,000 people in cold blood subsequently attain the exalted status of arahant? The answer is that, having examined the accumulation of spiritual wealth in Angulimala's heart, the Buddha saw that during his eons-long journey through Sangsaric existence, he had been responsible for an incalculable number of virtuous acts of generosity, moral integrity, and spiritual awareness. He had thus amassed an enormous quantity of worthy kama, the cumulative effect of which was immeasurably greater than the consequences of the evil actions he committed in his present life. Reconnecting with his rich karmic legacy, Angulimala responded to the Buddha's command that he stop his wrongdoing by throwing away his weapons, renouncing his acts of terror, and wholeheartedly embracing the Buddha's teachings for the sake of attaining the highest of spiritual goals. In the end, the personality embedded in the five aggregates had not changed. It was the undefiled awareness detached from the personality that had undergone a transformation. The Buddha stated that among human beings, only a Buddha could totally transform his innate personality and leave his inborn character traits behind. All other human beings are unable to escape from the character and temperament with which they were born. For this reason, it can be misleading to judge someone's spiritual worth merely by their behavior or appearance. In fact, the part that holds the true essence of a person is invisible to human sensory perception. For instance, Ajahn Mond was by nature articulate and charismatic. His mind was energetic and tended to experience dynamic occurrences in meditation. These character traits remained with him throughout his life. His basic temperament never changed. Even after he attained enlightenment, these innate character traits were still part of his personality, part of the person called Ajahn Mond that we all knew. Ajahn Sao, on the other hand, was by nature brief and impassive in speech and reclusive in habits. His mind was placid, smooth, and buoyant. These personality traits remained unchanged even after enlightenment. It was obvious to those who knew them that both men had vastly different personalities. 
Far less obvious was the fact that in terms of inner wealth and purity of heart, both men were in essence the same, with not a hair's breadth between them. To indicate how external appearances can deceive, the Buddha told the story of a monk who was so decorous and refined in his conduct that his fellow monks assumed he must be enlightened. But when someone asked the Buddha if this monk was indeed an arahant, since his behavior was so inspiring, the Buddha replied, No, not yet. The Buddha elaborated, explaining that these were personality traits that the monk had inherited from previous lifetimes when he'd been born as a lion, whose natural manner was always regal and majestic. Having now been born a human being and ordained a Buddhist monk, he'd brought those elegant mannerisms with him. Internally, however, he was still subject to the ill-mannered boorishness of the defilements. Mine may have been the opposite case. It was during this rains retreat that Ajahn Mund began referring to me as gold wrapped in rags. It was his way of paying tribute to the brightness of the heart shining through a boorish personality. I took the compliment humbly and with caution because even then Ajahn Mund could turn quickly and scold me at any moment. While spending the rains retreat at Bon Kok Monastery that year, a debilitating inflammation developed in the tendons of my right leg. The pain started at the hip and extended down to the foot, which made standing and walking very difficult. The pain I experienced felt like a boa constrictor had wrapped itself tightly around my leg. Ajahn Mond started calling me the cripple when he watched me limping around the grounds of the monastery. Eventually, the excruciating pain moved up from my legs and spread into my upper body as well. Then I couldn't move around at all. Tan Tong Pan, the monk whom I had befriended at Ajahn Mon's monastery in Chiang Mai, concocted a curative treatment by soaking whole grain rice overnight in warm water and then pounding it into a white mush. He also took handfuls of the extremely bitter medicinal vine called Borapet, pounded it to pulp, kneaded lots of water into the pulp, and strained the borapet infused water out of it. After that, he combined the rice mush with the borapet water, poured the mixture into empty liquor bottles, and buried them underground for three days and nights. When the bottles were buried, the tops of the bottles had to protrude out of the earth about one inch. When the concoction was fully matured and ready for consumption, Tan Tong Han offered me the medicine. According to Buddhist monastic rules, all food items like rice must be consumed before noon. So I had to take Tan Tong Pan's medicine between the hours of dawn and noon each day. I drank one full bottle every day until all the medicine was gone. By the end of this treatment, my tendonitis had been cured. While living with Ajahn Mon, I remained my typically stubborn self, but stubborn in the way of a practicing monk. For instance, I had a tendency to argue with Ajahn Mon when I thought my reasoning was strong. But each time my views conflicted with his, I was put in my place by my teacher's superior wisdom. I must have been one of Ajahn Mon's most bothersome disciples. I accept full blame for that character flaw. Nonetheless, to this day, I have no misgivings about speaking out so boldly. Although my arguments with him may have sounded like shouting matches, my intention was to test my doggedly held views against the unshakable truth of Ajahn Mand's knowledge and understanding. The more I defended my opinions, the more I realized that he had all the truth on his side. Courageous though I was, I always fought a losing battle. After each exchange, I reflected carefully on what he had said and respectfully accepted its truth with all my heart. On the few occasions when I stubbornly refused to yield to his teaching because I couldn't understand its meaning, I'd look for another opportunity to debate him. But I always came away battered and bruised by the power of his reasoning, with my opinions tied in knots. Although Ajahn Mond was fully aware of my opinionated ways, he tolerated my outbursts because they were spoken in search of a clearer understanding. He never tried to change my attitude. 
Even today, my stubborn character trait often prevails. I can be single-minded and argumentative with monks and lay supporters alike when I have reason to be, which leads some people to think that I'm not a very nice person. Alas, the curse of the old rag. Shortly after the 1942 Rains retreat ended, Ajahn Mon announced to the monks that he intended to move his residence from Bon Kok to the forested hillside surrounding the village of Namon. He planned to set up camp in an enormous wilderness area that was 60 miles wide and almost unlimited in length as it extended along a series of overlapping mountain ranges that seemed to stretch on forever. Many monks had gathered around Ajahn Mon at Ban Kok Monastery by that time, and most of them intended to accompany him on the journey. Among those monks, Ajahn Mahabua stood out the most to me. He was a few years older than I was, but perhaps not yet wiser. His tough, uncompromising strictness set him apart from the others. His bold, outspoken character reminded me of something Ajahn Mon told me several years before, when he saw a vision of himself seated majestically astride a white elephant, while two young monks straddled smaller elephants just behind him. Ajahn Mond understood that these two young monks would attain full enlightenment soon after he passed away, and that they would bring enormous benefit to Buddhists everywhere. Although Ajahn Mond did not name the monks that appeared in his vision, he described to me their predominant character traits, which sounded very much like my own. I recognized many of these traits in Ajahn Mahabua as well. I instinctively surmised that he must be one of the monks that Ajahn Mon was referring to in Chiang Mai. By this time I'd been living with Ajahn Mon and attending to his needs for almost three years. Looking toward the future, I felt the time was right for me to begin striking out on my own. I sought the opportunity to devote all my attention and effort to overcoming a persistent form of delusion that still plagued my meditation. Ajahn Mahabua's presence made that decision much easier for me because I sincerely believed I could entrust him with the duties and responsibilities that I undertook on Ajahn Mond's behalf. I saw that Ajahn Mahabua was diligent, thorough, and attentive to detail. He appeared to be trustworthy especially when it came to matters pertaining to Ajahn Mon or Sangha activities. He was obviously capable of handling the pressure of serving Ajahn Mon without becoming flustered or upset by the demands of the assignment. Attending to Ajahn Mon's needs on a regular basis provided many opportunities for good character development and success in meditation. But the duties were also demanding and sometimes stressful. A monk undertaking these responsibilities was obliged to remain very observant and vigilant whenever he was in Ajahn Mond's presence. He couldn't just go through the motions, performing his duties in a routine, mechanical fashion. He was expected to show a reason and a purpose for everything he did, whether it concerned how he cleaned Ajahn Mond's residence, how he looked after his requisites, or how he carried out errands. Every day, Ajahn Mon's residence had to be cleaned and straightened up. His bowl and robes freshened in the sunshine and put away neatly, his bedding aired out and put back in its place, and his tea kettle and spittoon washed, wiped dry, and placed in its proper location. Everything needed to be in order and be done quickly and efficiently. Ajahn Mon did not put up with monks who hurriedly finished their duties by cutting corners nor would he tolerate monks who only reluctantly did what they were told to do, because they were unwilling to put their hearts into the task. By nature, Ajahn Mon always preferred to live quietly by himself. The monks living with him were discouraged from bothering him unless the circumstances truly required it. Those monks attending to his personal needs had to be very circumspect in his presence. They had to step so quietly that they made no sound when walking on the floor. They wiped their feet thoroughly after washing them so as not to leave wet footprints on the floorboards. They took extra care to work soundlessly when shaking out robes or opening windows and doors. As a result, only monks deemed to be trustworthy were selected to oversee Ajahn Mond's personal needs. 
since by nature a John Mond was very thorough and meticulous. His attendant monk had to decide what action was appropriate in each instance, and then see that the other monks carefully followed this regimen. For this reason, monks attending to him were carefully chosen to ensure that their behavior did not conflict with his refined temperament. Keeping all of these factors in mind, I felt confident handing off this responsibility to Ajahn Mahabua. I myself had spent the previous several years attending to Ajahn Mund's personal needs and overseeing arrangements for his health care. I learned early on that practicing with him wasn't simply a matter of listening to teachings about Dhamma. I needed to attune my mind to how he reasoned things out, how he expressed his ideas, and how he deported himself, until they were firmly assimilated into the way I myself thought, spoke, and acted. Living with him for such a long time allowed me to regularly observe his habits, his conduct, his virtues, and his wisdom, day in and day out, under all circumstances. In a similar vein, living with Ajahn Mond forced me to remain so constantly restrained and watchful that mental vigilance eventually became an ingrained habit. Because of that, I felt that if I left Ajahn Mond this time to wander Dutanga on my own, I'd be able to take care of myself, using the various spiritual qualities I'd gained from his practical training. After appropriate arrangements were made for his care, I paid my heartfelt respects to Ajahn Mon and humbly requested his permission to leave. With permission granted, I bowed again and begged his forgiveness for anything offensive I might have done in his presence, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I then departed Ban Kok Monastery and hiked to Na Si Nguyen village, where I set up camp in a nearby forest cemetery. Finding the location suitable for accelerating my meditation practice, I remained in the vicinity of Na Si Nguyen through the end of the next rains retreat. My encampment was just half a day's walk from Ban Kok Monastery, which made it convenient to walk there when I had a question about my meditation. Twice a month on lunar observance days, I made a day journey to Ban Kok to join the Sangha for Patimoka chanting, and to listen to the Dhamma talks Ajahn Mon gave on those occasions. Afterward, I would hike back to Na Si Nguyen village, reaching my encampment just as night fell. After the rains retreat, I wandered Dutanga in the surrounding mountains. I considered hiking from place to place to be another aspect of my meditation practice. Once I had determined the mountain range or forest I wanted to head for, I focused my mind on the practice and proceeded as though I was doing walking meditation with the forest trail as my path. I didn't worry about where I might find the next village or whether I'd reach it before nightfall. I simply resolved to walk until dusk, then look for a place to rest for the night. The next morning I'd continue until I reached the nearest village, where I collected alms food from the local inhabitants as I passed through. I was content to eat whatever food they offered. The quality of the food was usually poor, but that no longer bothered me. It was enough to keep me going from one day to the next, which was all that really mattered. I continued trekking through those wilderness areas until I found a place that suited my purpose of setting up camp to practice intensive meditation for an extended period of time. Such a location preferably provided sufficient protection from the weather, a reliable source of fresh water, and a small village within walking distance. As soon as I had settled in, I turned my attention to redoubling my efforts, alternating walking and sitting meditation around the clock, day and night. My meditation at that time was primarily focused on insight practices, mainly those that investigated the body and the sense faculties. Ajahn Mond always stressed that monks cannot afford to be lazy and must constantly remain diligent. This attitude required a lot more willpower now that I no longer had Ajahn Mond to urge me to put forth greater effort. I had felt so comfortable and secure living in his presence that, now alone, I occasionally cried because I missed him. I valued my connection with Ajahn Mond so much that no matter how far I wandered on my Dutanga travels, 
I always returned to a place within walking distance of his monastery to set up camp for the rain's retreat each year. Every dry season, I trekked off to meditate in the Pupan Mountains, following my free-roaming spirit. But regardless of how far I ranged, I invariably hiked back to pay respects to Ajahn Man, as I always considered him as the inspiration for my life, the one who continually shed light on the Dhamma path for me. What passes for Dutanga training in the present day and age is radically different from the way we practiced it in the past. The current practice is so easygoing and comfortable that the monks behave more like privileged royalty than hardened practitioners. Some of them are so afraid of sunburn they don't dare stand out in the sun. When wandering Dutanga, instead of going on foot like practicing monks of old, they travel in the comfort of a car or a bus. Because their initial approach to the practice contradicts the true purpose of Dhamma, they inevitably start out on the wrong foot and continue to veer off the path from there. Staying with Ajahn Mun, the training was always extremely difficult. The food was never as sumptuous and expensive as we find so often nowadays. Previously, we ate only chilies and salt with our plain rice, which made us hungry to imbibe our fill of the Dhamma instead. Now so many varieties of food are available to Dutanga monks that they've become thoroughly spoiled. Ajahn Mon taught us to put our lives on the line for Dhamma, so we never concerned ourselves with the quality or the quantity of what we put in our mouths. Today, on the other hand, attachment to food takes precedence over Dhamma. Consequently, modern-day Dutanga monks prefer to walk around the town's crowded streets and markets, not daring to venture too far from their ever-dependable support network. What a shame, 